Well, welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast with me as usual is Rob Hirschfeld. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Stephen. And, uh, you know, I always talk about great guests, but this is one of the all-time guests. I, I, I think uh, we have to put John Willis up as a, a top three or four guest to have on a podcast. No one's better than John. And, and John, uh, uh, you're the VP of DevOps and Digital Practices at SJ Technologies. And I think you change companies more than I do, so I've lost track. So you're John, here, uh, good, good morning. You, 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 I, I look for signals. I see when did Stephen changed his job. Okay, oh, I, I got about a three month window. Now I have to change the job. <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know your your career uh, trajectory. Anyway, for our listeners, can you just give us a quick overview of yourself, and then uh, we'll jump in. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, just quickly a couple of things. I've been deeply, deeply involved in the DevOps movement from you know from really kind of the the defining uh, day, if you will, which was Gent. Um, you know, I was I was the only American in at the first DevOps day that Patrick DeBois ran in, in Ghent. Uh, that was back in 2009, um, and then just been heavily involved. I was kind of one of the core, um, you know, progenitors of the DevOps days in the U.S. Damon Edwards and I, my my DevOps Cafe podcast host, we we started the Silicon Valley um, one, ran that for a few years, and then was instrumental. I was early in it, Chef. I was a kind of the uh, ninth person in it, Chef, helped build the customer-facing business, and part of that role was driving DevOps. So I, I went to almost every DevOps days on the planet, uh, drove, it just drove the movement, and then got lucky and met Gene Kim along the way, and then, uh, you know, helped Gene kind of, you know, codify the ending of the Phoenix Project. I mean, I didn't write it, but Patrick DeBoer and I and him were all working on a project together uh, for something that ultimately came to DevOps Handbook. Uh, later on, uh, Jez joined uh, DevOps Handbook now has sold uh, a little over its first year, uh, 100,000 copies, piggybacking the Phoenix Project of 400,000. Uh, sometime today, I think my, uh, my second project, which is called Beyond the Phoenix Project, an audio project that I've done with Gene. Uh, on the technical side, you know, as I said, Chef, I work for a company called Instratius. And in fact, no, I met, I met you, Rob, to Chef, but I think yeah. we got more deeply involved with Stratus because Stratus was a multi-cloud manager and you were still at Dell. We sold that to Dell um, and um, got to work a little closer with Rob then. And then I went out and did some networking stuff and wound up doing another startup uh, called Socket Plane that we, um, before we even got started, we got sold to Docker, spent um, almost two years at Docker and then left about five months ago to, um, to work on primarily uh, services and transformation. So DevOps transformation, um, helping people kind of understand how to, um, you know, not product specific, you know, very um, pattern and practice specific. There you go. So Rob, I think he's only, he only knows a little bit about DevOps. So he is, just a we, bit we bow before, before. Bow the before God Dell, of American Dell. Dell. Oh, geez, stop that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you haven't checked out the various projects that John's on, check out the, the new audio uh, book. Or, I, is it, you're calling it a book? What's the, how are you? Yeah, it's a weird thing. I mean, I, just quickly, there's an interesting explanation of that is that, you know, the Phoenix Project written by Gene Kim, um, uh, Stafford, and Kevin Baer, that was a purposeful rewrite of Elliot Gorat's The Goal, The Father of Theory Constraints, right? And 20, in 1983, um, Elliot Gorat wrote The Goal, um, and it's a novel. It's a novel about a factory and automated robots and enclaves. And Gene had a kind of a 10-year uh, goal to write, you know, very specific and e even took a, a PhD, uh, a graduate level course, sorry, graduate level course on theory constraints to make sure that they got it so right to do a modern-day version of The Goal, a uh, purposeful, architected, isomorphically mapped to the goal. Uh, some people say, well, he ripped off the goal. No, no, that was the point. <laughs> and, you know, that, yeah. Yeah, and it was, yeah, right. And, and, um, you know, and, and the, you know, the constraints in there, you know, won't give too much away. Most people have read it. I'm sure almost everybody's on this list of sparkers, but it's it, instead of like automated robots and enclaves, it's a um, Java coda and uh, basically a Java Tomcat stack basically. Right. Which is brilliant. Right. But what Elliot Gorat did is 20 years after he wrote the goal, he did this audio only book. So it's kind of weird, like you asked me, is it a book, right? It, like it's listed as a book, but it was audio only, be called Beyond the Goal. So about, you know, a little, um, you know, maybe a year ago or so, I approached Gene about like, would it be interesting to do a Beyond the Phoenix Project? So that, oh, that's, that's really, so it's a, 
it is audio only. Uh, although I think we'll we we'll kind of might do this in reverse order, right? We we started. With audio. <laughs> we might actually turn it into a book because the the content yes. It makes wonderful. sense to me. And, and one of the things you didn't mention is that you, you and Damon used to do um, a DevOps Cafe podcast. So Yeah, uh, we still do it. It's just it was so lazy that we got like our uh, our latency. It's gotten like ridiculously bad between podcasts. So we'll see. Makes perfect sense. So for this, if you want to turn the tables on me, I'm I would be honored. But um, so let's let's keep it conversational. And because this this podcast really comes out of the the classic John and Rob have a hallway conversation um, and we, we figure, you know, we should record this because some of the topics we're, we're discussing are industry broad ones that, that you know, you, you pull other people into that conversation in the hallway. And, and so yeah, no. effectively us pulling people into a conversation in the hallway to talk about SRE, DevOps, uh, Q&A, Docker, open source. Yeah, you, name it. you know, it's funny, um, Damon and I, for almost the first year when we met, we'd have just these conversations almost almost every week, but at least a couple of times a month. And at one point, I, I, I said to him, you know, we should be recording this, you know. And then we're like, yeah, duh. You know, because we have these amazing discussions about early days of DevOps and what, you know, it, what was going right, what was going wrong, you know, our opinions about the industry, it was just really good stuff, and anybody who's listened to our podcast, we, we, we match really well together conversationally, like me and you. Still, still very timely. So mm -hmm. you had two or three things on your mind that you wanted to start with. Um, where, do, where do you want to go? Yeah, you know, I'll start with Docker. You know, I think it's, um, I, I, you know, I, so, you know, right now, as we all know, and you know this because, you know, you've been doing a lot of bleeding edge technology for, for ever since I've known you. <laughs> in the space where it is now kind of next generation platforms Kubernetes. I'm, I'm I, laughing because automating physical servers doesn't feel bleeding edge, but, yeah, no, yeah, but you're like, entirely right. <laughs> right. Like they, they'll, they'll figure it out that it is, but, um, but, but um, the, the thing I, I get frustrated with, right. It's already, you know, you go to these large corporations and I, when I left Docker, I started going um, mm -hmm. just visiting companies. It's something I used to love to do uh, kind of pre Docker days. Um, which is, you know, somebody talked to somebody and said, yeah, I, I come there for a day. And I, I do this trade where I like say, you know, I'll do a lunch and learn. I'll do executive briefings. But, but what I want in return is I want to spend some time with your teams. Right. You know, I, so, so it's not like I'm just going to come there and speak. I mean, like the, the trade is, you know, in the morning I want to meet, like I want to meet some of the teams that you really struggle to get, you know, adoption or transformation. And so since I left Docker, I probably visited almost 15 companies now, right? So it's been a blast. But, you know, so you go in and, you know, you'll see them talking about, you know, where they're at with platforms and you'll ask them about next generation platforms and you get some scratches in the heads. And most everybody in the room has heard of Kubernetes and either they're, they're running some, you know, pilot there. But then I'll say, well, you know, what about Istio and Envoy? And then, uh, then, then it drops like precipitously, right? And that, like the, whoa, what's that, right? And... I'm like, you really need to know about these things if you're, uh, if you're doing next generation, you know, um, platforms, right? And then, like, and then so, I'm going to talk about the things beyond that. So, but my only yeah. point, the point I want to get to is not a debate of what you should have or shouldn't have, is that it is daunting the task that large enterprises have to deal with now in terms of the complexity and the new stuff and all the stuff that's like, they don't even know it's getting thrown at them. And so to bring it all the way back to the kind of Docker discussion, like I think everybody thinks they're safe with the quote unquote Docker discussion, but what, you know, Docker did something, um, what, a little over a year ago where they, um, they changed the name of the project to Moby, right? And uh, right. So, so the thing is people run around and say, oh, we run Docker, or we do Docker, and I'm like, hold on a second. <laughs> trying to fix the brain confusion problem, right? Um, you know, because you're not running Moby, you know, like, I, I don't know anybody who's running Moby, to be honest with you. Um, and, and Moby's the open source. The open right, source so what they did is, you know, it was really kind of what a, what, like a Red Hat play, right? Which was, you know, there was a back right. in the day, um, now some people say it wasn't like the, the, the ends when the, don't match what, what the, um, you know, what the task was to do this. But in the end, what Docker had as a problem was there were a lot of people making money on Docker and, you know, they weren't really enjoying the ecosystem around them, right? Because Docker was so good. The open source Docker worked so well. Right. And it, 
And so what they did is kind of what Red Hat did, you know, and they did want to actually protect the community too, right? Like, you know, so Red Hat had the problems. So, um, you know, so they, you know, they went ahead and um, they kind of split out Red Hat, you know, the license, and then they created the open source, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, project, right? And, um, you know, and, and it was a way to say, you know, we have to create some momentum for the business, by the way. At the end of the day, open source is a business, you know, at some point. And, but we do, we don't want to just abandon and say, oh, by the way, tough, you know, all that stuff we've been giving you for free is now no longer available, right? So they did this compromise where they kind of renamed, um, you know, GitHub Docker Docker to Moby Moby. And then right. they had, um, then they created kind of the... Um, like, for, really like Fedora for Red Hat. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. It was like a Fedora Red Hat, you know, so like, okay, you know, it's still there, like you take it, but now you... Um, you know, the Docker, like to call it Docker, and by the way, trademark Docker, um, is um, you got to basically work with a sales rep. Now, there is a community edition, but, but the truth is, you know, you're either, you know, probably going to um, go, um, I, I mean, again, I don't think, you know, I, I, I get the impression, and I could be wrong, and people can write in and call me a jerk, but I don't see a whole lot of people taking Moby and moving forward. Um, there's a fair amount of people yeah. running community edition of Docker, but I think that's just a holding pattern you know, waiting to see what, you know, how the maturity level of the kind of, um, you know, the OCI container stuff really so, fleshed out from Google. So the, the main point right now is, because I just, I do want to hear some of your opinion on this. Yeah. Is so that I have a whole bunch of questions for you. Very, people are extremely confused because a lot of people just think, oh, what do you mean? I'm running Docker. I'm like, yeah, you really aren't running Docker. You're, you're running an uh, older version of OpenShift that supported Docker, but your next version is going to be a new, is not going to be Docker's containers unless you force it to go to a Docker sales rep and say, we want to run Docker Enterprise Edition with our OpenShift, right? That, and the OpenShift guy is, is like, true. why would you want to do that? We have a container that's OCI compatible. And I know I'm, some people, some people poor listeners, um, you know, that, uh, that have, you know, run C and container D and it has like, most of the componentry of what Docker has, right? Which is the same thing Google's saying. So, so, so to meta meta end this long rant of mine, <laughs> um, yeah. there's just incredible confusion out there right now about what is a container and what is your container strategy as an enterprise? Before we untangle that, do you mm -hmm. distinguish between production runtime for, for containers and developer tooling for containers? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, if you look at um, all the companies that built up around Docker. Right. You know, initially, now some of them have pivoted around Kubernetes and just generic containers, but, but initially, um, you know, there was just this whole ecosystem of reasonably successful, not mega successful, but reasonable success to, uh, businesses that were, um, you know, like a Weave or um, what's the other one that... Um, Tagera? With, uh, well, Tigera, but that's a that's a that's a network story. That would that would add another forty minutes to this. Your, but um, but uh, who's the other one that um, the 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 Cloud.com guys? I don't know why I'm going blank. That the founders of Cloud.com they Rancher. start what Rancher, Rancher, right? Rancher, and you know, and there's just a whole bunch of those type of products that really enjoyed the Docker ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. And and. You know, I, I don't know the revenues and I, I wouldn't be at liberty to uh, emit any revenues from Docker. All I'm saying is um, there was um, there was kind of an impedance mismatch <laughs> between the ecosystem partners revenue and, you know, the core provider, which was Docker's revenue. Uh, and and so it wasn't just things like Rancher and Weave. It was, you know, it was crypto systems. It was um, systems that detected and, you know, um, Grid, and people grid like yeah, that. I mean, you know, well, yeah, Twistlock's a great example. But I mean, the, I was, uh, you know, for a while, you know, you look at the business partner ecosystem of Docker, right? Like a lot of those companies have made a reasonable amount of money, right? Um, so yeah, so that's I, my my uh, definition is core Docker, and then this incredible ecosystem. I've never seen an ecosystem in my what thirty five years plus. Right an ecosystem built so fast and vibrant around one product in all of my career. <laughs> well, it certainly created a challenge for Docker because they were what they, I, some of what uh, I'm, I'm going to untangle a little bit because I don't believe that your statement of success for the ecosystem is as commercially valid as you're, you're saying. I, I think that there were a lot of companies that raised money 
from VCs around a, a container bubble. Yeah, but, um, but, but these companies were making, you know, again, I don't have our numbers, but some of these companies were doing, you know, uh, 50, 60, you know, getting close to breaking the 100 million run rate in a year, right? For, you know, for out of the box two year old companies, that's on, um, on product revenue or consumer product. Revenue. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't know what twist lock is, but I guarantee I, I'd have to bet twist locks in the 60 or 70. I'm totally guessing here. Um, you know, and then I, you know, I, I think I've, I've heard rumors of rancher doing, you know, not, not hundred million plus, but, but uh, reasonably high. And, you know, I, I guarantee you, if you had the, the raw data, of the, the companies in the ecosystem, I mean, none of them were like, I, my, so, so this, the, I, I, I'm a little skeptical uh, on, on some of this. I think you're right to an extent, but I also watched this very aggressive pivot towards Kubernetes from some of those same companies that thought that they were going to have standalone solutions. I, I, I don't and, disagree, right? And, then, and that was the nature of the beast, right, in that um, it clearly became, you know, the conversation three years ago was Docker, 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 Docker. Right. The conversation a year ago was Docker, Kubernetes, Kubernetes, Docker, right? Now it's and I would I would actually say containers. There was a big push um, about eighteen months ago when Docker was not being friendly in the community because they were trying to figure out the monetization story um, towards people saying containers, not Docker, um, because of the trademark confusion. Well, the trademark. They they you know that was a you know, that was a deal with the devil, really, right? In some ways, okay, you know what what are your alternatives? So you 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 do this thing, you, the Moby. Um, project, you basically turn Docker into a commercial project, you know, proprietary basically. Right. And then, um, and at the same time, you've been kind of walking up down this road, you know, this um, exit entry ramp to the highway, constantly uh, contributing. So it's like this split brain between, you know, I got to make money, I got to figure out a way to become a successful company, but I want to, my split brain is I've got to be a good citizen. Um, by contributing some of the stuff so we don't get hammered as a bad citizen in the open source community. And, and, and you know, and I will say, you know, um, you know, Docker has always been good citizens in the open source community. And so what you have then is this perfect storm of like, by the time you've contributed uh, run C container D and you've pretty almost fleshed out the ability to have a competitive container alternative, it's right. about the same time you do the Moby split, you know, which becomes like talk about a gamble, right? The perfect storm for an opportunity to change the conversation from Docker to just. So, you know, so I, so I saw that as a very interesting mm -hmm. operations versus development split. So Docker owns the developer experience. They've been amazing at building things that developers want to use that are simple and straightforward and very usable. Um, the monetization story in a lot of the ecosystem was running towards production use, where a lot of the things that Docker was doing were frustrating from an operational perspective. They were breaking APIs, they weren't consi testing consistently. There was a lot of things that, um, if I was trying to build a cluster and maintain an operable cluster, yeah. I, no, I, they, I mean, and this is what we were doing. No, Docker no, you're, was, you're spot on. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're sidelining multiple conversations here, right? <laughs> yes, we are. There was the perfect storm for a confusion. There was a perfect storm for bifurcation of Docker versus something else. And then right. you're absolutely right. There was a long thread of Docker doubling, tripling, and quadrupling down on the developer experience, thinking that, you know, that would take them to the promised land. Although there had been never an example in our industry, you know, maybe some of the Oracle tools, but, you know, Andrew Schaefer has this brilliant quote that I would never say when I worked at Docker, but he said that, you know, Docker will become the PDF of containers. In yeah. other words, like the PDF is like probably the most successful software product ever made. Right. And, uh, but like nobody pays for it. Right. And uh, you were at Dell. I don't remember. Um, Dell had acquired um, the, it was the, the large uh, software. My boy, my memory's getting quest. Hard. Quest. Right. And so Quest had acquired this company way on. There was a, it, was a, um, it was really an Oracle tool called Toad. Mm -hmm. It was a free tool. And if you were an Oracle DBA, you work or it was like a brilliant free tool that almost every, I think at one point that they said that um, that was 30 million people used this product. 
And the dev team was out. Yeah, you could you could tell them on one hand. For, nobody paid for that. Nobody paid for it. Uh -huh. yeah, I remember a discussion at Dell. I'll probably get in trouble. It's probably been long enough gone where somebody wanted to look into the monetization of like, this has got a $30 million customer base. It's like, yeah, a little too, little too late. In other words, it was an amazing tool that, you know, 30 million people around yeah. the world were using. And the basically, you know, I won't say zero revenue, but in the grand well, scheme. Uh, this to me is an industry problem that we have got to confront because our free software versus open software and right. We are not as an industry figuring out how, how to pay for the sustaining of software. It, it, it's right. a, you know, I know, I know in the beginning we talked about like what were the subjects we were going to talk about and we thought we'd shy away from open source, but I, I think, you know, that one of my big fears now, this is the, see, we call this the all over the place podcast, but uh, the, um, you know, one of my big fears is exactly that in that, um, you know, it's even worse, right? The problem with open source software, first off, is when it's a great product, you don't have to pay mm -hmm. for it. Chef was like that. Puppet was like that. In fact, the biggest enemy, I heard the first sales rep was Chef, and I remember you know, Ronnie, Ronnie Jones, a good friend of mine, he's at Evan and I.O. now, he's doing really well over there. Um, and he said, at one point he says, you know, what's this, um, you know, you know the, the Chef tool, the, you know, the kind of, uh, oh God, it was the, the command line interface Chef thing. Nice. He said, you know, what's the chef song? I'm like, well, it's a tool that comes with thing where you can run kind of in a standalone mode on, on a single node, and it's killing me. I call these people and they're like, nah, we use Chef Solo, right? Uh, yeah. Not even the free chef. Um, you know, so what happens is you got that. So you got people who, who uh, you know, the web scale mentality is um, like, we're going to do this. We're going to roll our sleeves. We're going to take one source. We're not going to pay anybody for anything. Um, you know, one more anecdotal story. When I, two weeks after I was at Chef, I went to this Chef meetup and uh, the Wikia, um, who, you know, ultimately became... Um, you know, Fastly, they got it, those guys at Fastly, mm -hmm. they were telling me, oh, they're, they're using Chef, and, you know, like, go, go talk to them. And, and I talked to one of the guys, and I'm like, yeah, we're, we're about to sell, you know, um, a SaaS-based version. He goes, well, first, we're not going to use SaaS. And two, like, we would not pay for open source software. Like, that's what we're good at. Like, that's, right. you know, that's what we do. Like, well, that's why we're better than everybody else. And then you add in the cloud guys, right? The cloud guys take everything they can from the open source community. And they don't pay a dime to anybody. So Correct. theoretically, at some point, you'd think that maybe VC funding for open source projects could dry up because there's only been one six, there are only a couple successful ads. It's not could, is. It is well, yeah, that, I mean, I, I try to be a little more optimistic than you, but, um, you know, I think the VCs I'm are raven. so greedy. I know. I'll they, tell like, you. They're so greedy that, like, they'll still, like, ooh, ooh, I think I could be the next, you know, I could be the next MySQL. You know, uh, so I, we, we've got a little bit of runway where they'll still invest because they're so greedy thinking they can, you know, they can do the next VMware. Or the, the, next. the only way you can do that is if you've done what Docker did and have a huge build out this huge viral um, dominance base. But even, you know, Docker has shown that it's there's no there's no yeah, easy no, the jury's Docker. out whether Docker is going to be. I mean, you know, here's the thing. Docker will be a successful. Um, there'll be a successful liquidation at some point. My theory is, and again, I have no data on this. I have no knowledge of this. I wasn't involved in any discussions related to this while I was there. <laughs> so to be legally clear, um, my opinion is they'll get acquired. Um, I, don't, I don't think they have, just like everybody else in this space, here's where I piss off all my chef and puppet friends. I mean, like the trajectory, well, first off, it, it, to, in today's world, if it takes you five years to be successful in, in a technology, you, you're in big trouble. Because the technology, we've already seen, what's Kubernetes? Uh, you know, Gawker is going to be, what, um, five years old in April. Yeah. Uh, Kubernetes in earnest probably started three years ago. I mean, I know it probably started four and a half, a little bit closer. Right. But, but before it was really on the radar. So Docker is, from a radar perspective, probably four years old. I would actually go as far as say Kubernetes only three years old. So the point is, technology shifts happen in, in you know, Sub five year sequences. Wait, wait, wait. Hold, you five wait, years I, to, I, to get an IPO, it's not going to happen. I, so I agree with you that we're seeing this increasing pace. I, at the same time, the, the reality is, is that the, the, these two year old projects are 
80-20 rule projects where they really haven't figured out the productization, the sustaining operations engineering that goes into making this stuff work. I mean, I, you know, my, what you're saying makes me, it's frustrating because I, I agree with you, but yet I know that to build a really rock solid, operationally valuable product takes years. It exactly. takes, yeah. oh, I, I know, I know. Right? You, you can't just, you can't just show up and say, I've got containers, I'm going to solve your problem. It's like it, if, if you did that, you would say, well, Linkerd, which was a precursor to Envoy, solved the problem. And we did, we actually did a podcast with the team from Buoyant and they're like, well, Linkerd was mostly right, but we think we got it right in this generation. Right. No, yeah, and, I get that. And, and so, I, I mean, I, I'm pulling my hair out. Well, That's why I keep my hair short about <laughs> <laughs> this. But, this this challenge because it's but it's an open source problem too because well uh, open source adds to the problem right that's the problem right in other words the, the truth is it takes a while to build like you said not only build a company anybody's built a company i built right. like and maybe three of them or four of them were really real enough to to take credit for it being you know an entrepreneur um but the point is you know, that first year, first two years, it's just so much chaos and inertia. And if you get funded and, and then there's this area where the funding is like, you know, just go out and get viral adoption. Don't worry about the maturity and the, the, and the revenue streams. And then you oh, get to a state where you have to worry about maturity and revenue streams. And the problem again is, you know, example, chef or puppet, right? Like, so by the time you still got to the revenue stream, you were still competing with yourself. You know, so if you're doing a proprietary product that like cures cancer, right? Like one year, two year, three year, but at some point you've got this solid base and you don't have your own self-inflicting attack vectors, right? Like, you know, um, open source, oh, I can do this myself. Um, open source, I can, somebody can fork it or, not, you know, we don't see a whole lot of forks in our so, industry. So there's, there's a DevOps thinking system problem here in open source that you're describing that I want to re-articulate very clearly. For the software industry as a whole to benefit, we have to have high degrees of reuse of product. And that means it has to be sustained. It means that somebody has to go and say, there's six people doing this mostly the same. We can consolidate it and sustain it and operate it. And open source right now does not incent the behavior to say, oh, because if you look at Ansible and Ansible uh, playbooks, mm -hmm. there are millions, especially popular stuff, there are, there are hundreds of Ansible playbooks that have small variations that nobody has any financial incentive yeah. to consolidate. Yeah. And the whole industry, I'm getting mad, the whole industry suffers because you have hundreds of people repeating work that they actually should have been yeah. able to use in a standard way. But this, this few people on the planet can relate to what I'm about to say, and I'm, I'm, we're starting to get, in, at least from my perspective, into a philosophical realm that I'm unqualified to, <laughs> to discuss. <laughs> but I mean, like, you know, I think humans, you know, I mean, again, what, what happens with open source is we try to gravitate towards some kind of um, consensus or aggregation or committee or standard, right? And then you see this really, in, you know, so the, this, it, it's, um, you know, you, the standardization is um, is basically orthogonal to uh, to um, you know um, commercialization basically right because what happened with OpenStack right OpenStack oh it's a big party let's all join in and and I know you were much deeper in this yeah. but like seven or eight bodies got in they were all sharing and it seemed like the minute somebody saw an angle for a secret source oh yeah let's all build this and then somebody like whispered to their colleague hey. I just saw an angle here and they'd run off and then, you know, create their own little version of it to turn around and sell it back. So I, I agree with what you're saying. Is I, but that, I would, I would rather see that John than because what I actually yeah, saw least, was we didn't, we didn't get consensus. But we suck at it. Like OpenStack was, you know, like that should have been like an amazing, like that in my, again, I'll go back to my career, the potential, you know, now we make fun of it. I know, me less, uh, you less than me, but I make fun of OpenStack when people bring it up, right? Like, oh my God, really? Um, like the way I make fun of Tivoli, I mean, but, um, but the thing was that like that really was, you know, I remember being, you know, meeting, talking to Lou Mormon on the first, you know, they announced it at, um, 
I think it was uh, 2008, maybe, or two, maybe 2009, um, OSCON. You know, Rackspace had this big party, and they talked about it. And, yep. you know, and, like, it sounded like an amazing thing for the industry. Like, this unfinished open source project where everybody's going to roll up the sleeves and right. become this unbelievable collaboration of humans. Kubernetes, Kuber, and Kubernetes, Kubernetes, but here's the problem. Well, Kubernetes might have the same damn problem because here's the thing. Boy, I, I don't know who's going to listen to this statement. Um, the, you know, the Kubernetes is going to have the same damn problem because look at what you got right now. You got OpenShift. You mm -hmm. got the, the PKI stuff in Pivotal. You got, you know, Kubernetes driving then. And then you yeah. have Docker now with a Kubernetes distro. And, you know, you still have Mesosphere flying around in the ointment. Um, uh -huh. So Amazon, like all oh, that's about to about for a customer, right? It's and a collision FBO cost. And everybody. But but and here's my here's my problem with this. And I actually do like technology, folks. <laughs> I we no, and but but we want it to stop hurting people. I know exactly. And when, oh, I'm gonna I, I'm I'm you you, know, you I, you're getting angry. I'm getting ranty. Um, <laughs> that's the pro you just hit the, I'm done being angry, by the, way. Of the freaking problem. I want to say another word other than freaking, but you just hit the core of the problem is we, we all want to be, I know I've known you for a while. You're a class act. You're a class technician. Um, same thing. We like the reason I do DevOps is I want to help people get this shit right. Yeah. But the problem is in the aggregate, we screw it up every time. You know I mean? The, the, the global aggregate, you know, of, you know, we just seem to, you know, oh, I think most of us that do these things that are, you know, friends of ours and people we respect, I think we wake up in the morning with this idea that we want to make people's life better. I mean, Gene Kim says, you know, the reason why he started the whole DevOps movement and IT revolution was to, um, you know, make the lives of a million IT professionals better, right? right? And, and I think we all wake up in the morning with that, but somehow when we all kind of put our heads together, <laughs> We just screw the enterprise customers like, well, you know, I'll go back to the original thing right now. You go to an enterprise right now, they're like, what the heck should I be? And by the way, don't even mention serverless. No, and, and this to me is where in open source, we assume that somebody's going to fork and maintain. Yeah. And, and when you do that, you, you, take away vendors' ability to support and sustain. Because a vendor commercially is motivated by creating patterns of repeatable use. As a vendor, our value is that people use hardware and data centers in consistent, repeatable ways so that we can fix it for one person and hand it to everybody. And that is a value, right? The problem I, I'm, I'm trying to struggle with with open source right now is that open source is not incenting this mm -hmm. pattern of behavior where if one person breaks, then the, they can, there is somebody who has a, an incentive to improve the efficiency of that fix, making it into everybody else in the community. And where OpenStack fell down was that every single deployment because of the vendor fragmentation, because of the open source fragmentation, none of the operational, which is really where people get value, the operational com constructs weren't flowing back into a, a way that we would efficiently redistribute those fixes because there was no financial incentive to do that. Well, in, right. in, in, over. In, Sorry, in, that's my in, like the whole idea of a fork, right? In fact, there's only been two successful forks as far as I can tell. Maybe there's more, right? It is the Ubuntu and it was the uh, fork of Nagios, right? And that arguably, you know, I mean, it was successful in that they actually went through it. They turned the business into it. Um, but, like, you don't see forks. And, in fact, when you – and, again, goes back to uh, – I didn't know this was going to be a rant podcast. It goes back to podcast, that the only way open source really gets going is that the, the whole model is kind of broke because open source, like you said, should be this – this model of sharing and contribution and then reusability through the fork mechanism. But what, ha what happens in like all the projects I've been involved with in the last say 10 years, right? They get venture capital, <laughs> right? So like, so immediately it, the, the whole thing is um, completely um, bastardized from the get go. And then like what you see then on most projects is a protectionism around the core of the project. I asked Luke Kniss, I'll get myself in trouble, but you know, 
I, yeah, I like Luke, but you know, he's had, he's had some battle scars and the way he's behaved over the years. And, um, and, you know, I asked him what, you know, what he thought about uh, somebody forking puppet and like his mm -hmm. face got red. He got mad. Right. Um, I asked Ethan Godstone about the fork of Nagios. Um, the guy who was the original, um, creator of Nagios. I mean, he was furious, you know, um, yeah. And, and then some people like, you know, Adam Jacobs is a good guy and a chef, and I'm sure he would say in public, oh, yes, please go right ahead. But the truth of the matter is if somebody forks chef, there'd be absolute chaos in the kingdom. Right. Let me go. So, the, yeah, the value so. is sustaining. And this is what, to me, we, we, we don't talk about well. And we're, I want to talk about SRE a little bit. So, um, We'll, we'll, we'll just, we'll have to shove it, but the op, this is, I've been spending a lot of time and if somebody's listening to this and wants to get on the podcast and talk to me about the operational imperative around sustaining software and open source software, I, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about this right now. John, you and I, we're just touching the surface on, on where this really needs to go. You, know, you want to talk about SRE, so. Well, let me do this one last thing, because I do, you know, <laughs> I, I do advisement for a lot of startups, right, including yours and, and, um, and, you know, I, the one of the things that the questions comes up really early, should we open source this, John, or not? Like, and I'm like, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, you know, I'll give you my opinion. And I say that I, I, I give them the, um, the, the kind of what the, the way I describe it is there's two arcs with, um, you know, with these new bleeding edge technologies. You know, it, there's an arc of viral adoption, you know, the, the kind of the Docker original arc, right? Or, or even chef arc, right? And, and like, and then there's the actual monetary, the revenue arc, right? And one of the problems that is if you don't really know what you want to do from a liquidation standpoint, and, and you know, everybody's like, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to run this forever, you know, and that's the, the grandstanding version of every company. But you really need to sit down in the beginning and think about, am I going for an acquisition in, you know, zero to five years? And if I'm going to an acquisition in zero to five years, probably these days, probably three years, then I want to really beef up the, um, the viral adoption arc. And in which case I want to open source and I want everybody on the freaking planet to have a touch point with my stuff. Yep. But the problem that you have is if, if you're actually going for the long haul, right. You know I mean? Like again, you get these companies, they get out, you know, they think they're going to IPO, right. And the, and the stock market has been very brutal. Like in 2016, pivotal and, and pivotal and, um, and both Puppet was supposed to IPO. Mm -hmm. In 2016, was, the beginning of the year was like a scary beginning of the year, and all those got called off. Yep. So they all got pushed back two or three years, even on, you know, when they were actually, you know, run rate ready. You know, at least Puppet was finally run rate ready for an IPO in 2016, and now there's rumor of 2018, but now 2018, beginning of the year, looks very much like the beginning of 2016. So I think they're all gonna get scared off again. So the question then is, you know, these people get IPO fever, right? Like they think, you know, oh, we're going to IPO. And, and so now they start turning down 200, 300 million, 400 million dollar offers. Mm -hmm. They think, oh, you know, like if we IPO, like, you know, we're going to make a billion dollars, right? And, and um, but un unfortunately, at some point that arc changes, like the, the crossover uh, revenue, some, somebody said, it's a modified quote, they said, the worst thing that can happen to a successful open source company is they can actually start making money. Right, because then the revenue arc starts yeah. when it, it will cross over the optical arc. And at which point now the, the, um, the industry, the buyers, the mergers acquisition, possibly even, um, you know, banks that might think about taking your IPO are going to be not focused anymore on your viral adoption. You know, as soon as that, you know, you got this viral adoption, it's amazing. And all of a sudden your revenue arc starts to get close to that. And now the revenue arc becomes the arc that everybody watches. So back to my original point, I tell people, if you're going to sell this thing, if the goal is to sell this thing in three to five years, you don't have to tell all your customers that's your goal. Then go for the open source arc and get everybody on the planet using it. Right. But if you're going for the long haul, I'm going to build a company and I, you know, I'm going to go ahead and try to build this and, and create solid revenue growth. You know, people, what I create is what people are willing to pay for. Right. It's another problem with open source, right? Like, prior open source companies had to validate what they did and their validation was what people what the market paid for it open source creates this weird um 
you know, um, this weird edge case where you, you get validation in a weird way. Oh, we got, you know, I got like 18 million downloads. It's not, it's not, well, this, it's not real. So this is, and, and I think you and I are going to have to plan a part two podcast. Yeah. To cover so, yeah, other, I other to read another time, but like this is the final yeah. say is that no, but, 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 but you go you, proprietary to, do not go open source. If the long haul is to create a great product that customers are going to, that your belief system and your business value is that people are going to pay good value in the market for that solution. And by the way, that's a constant tension that you kind of lose with open source because you get away. That, I mean, if, if you're in a revenue arc from day one, right. you know, like every quarter what's going on and you have to be more aggressive about, you can't, I mean, look at Docker again. I am ranting like hell here. Rob, never invite me back on one of these. <laughs> You're, you have a front seat anytime you want. No, I, mean, you know, that, I think that was problem problem with Docker, right? Docker would like have these, you know, Solomon is a great guy, brilliant young man, like a lovely man. I do, you know, I, I, I think dearly of him. He helped, um, yeah. you know, instigate the acquiring of my company. I mean, but he didn't have any of that monetary tension so he would say, okay, well, let's just go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and do right. this, right? And none of that got validated against customer, you know, what customers would pay for it. If you go with a proprietary non-open source arc, there's only one validation. Are people paying you the fair market value for your solution? And it actually creates a better arc in terms of your technology and your product. But again, it comes down to what are you actually trying to do with your business? So so this is, so Rackend's doing a blended approach, which maybe we're nuts for, because digital rebar for us is open, is open source because it's replacing cobbler, which is open source. And so we are very deliberate in saying, if you're replacing cobbler, we will help you. That, you know, it, nobody's supporting it. It doesn't keep up. There's, there's, right, we will help you because that's a, that's a community benefit. And digital rebar, open source, more than covers everything that Cobbler needs. And everything in a data center is a vendored product. And it is fragile and changing and snowflaked out the wazoo. And sustaining a product in that environment requires engineers. It requires things that are not a container being shipped into a standard operating system. It requires somebody being able to say, this version of this server with this Eufy boot has this weird flake in it, and somebody has to sustain that and make sure that we don't break it in the future. And for that, we need revenue because that's engineers that you have to feed. It's things that you can't have to break, it's, or you can't break going forward. And so that type of sustaining engineering, right, that is creating value for our customers and our community. The community free rides to an extent, and we're okay with that. But at the end of the day, everything in your data center is going to touch a thing that you bought. And for us to sustain, do that, either you're going to get it from that, the vendor you bought it from, or you're going to pay somebody to sustain it. Um, and the idea that, you know, Somebody at somebody other um, other company is going to care about your snowflake. It is just not. I haven't seen that turn into a model. Um, yeah, no, it's this is not an easy question because it's not. if I'm doing a startup right now, I'm probably not even going to follow my own advice. <laughs> I'm going to do open source to start with, you know. And then, so that's the you, you have to. Of all my ranting and like advice to everybody else. Um, you know, the model I see to get in people's face as quick as possible is open source. And again, the hard part is, is being um, honest to the, the market value of the technology. And, and that's just incredibly hard. I mean, I think the your reason, model- The reason for open source though is not to give your product away for free. No, right? I get, no, but no, not, well, all right. So there's, there's three reasons for open source to be really cynical. One is the utopia, you know, uh, um, like, and, and I believe that, but I just think that humans don't get that right, which is we all collaborate and, you know, um, you know, somebody creates a project, somebody, you know, forks it and they, they give attribution and they build on top of that. And then somebody else builds on top of that. And we, you know, I mean, one of the biggest, um, 
you know, people hated Adam Jacob for years because he, they were mad. In fact, all of Europe was pretty much mad at your uh, Adam because he didn't fork puppet. And to the yeah. fork puppet, everybody at puppet community in the U.S. would have been furious, right? So, um, you know, and, and like it didn't make sense to fork. He, he basically had a really new idea of how to do infrastructure as code. Right. Um, but so that's that, that's the 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 open source you know Nirvana model where again I, I guess being fifty eight being like so cynical that I just don't think humans can get this right. I mean it's it's why like communism doesn't work. <laughs> but but right. but sec, but the second one is um is the one that I I tend to fall back to which is like this idea if I can get lots of people using it's not about being free i agree it's like and it's not just like getting everybody to kind of clone it or start or use it or contribute or write blog articles about it or right that becomes an amazing ecosystem that like these you know joe schmo from idaho writes a four-page article about how brilliant your the part one is how brilliant your technology part two is an exact explanation of how to install it, all the things that get in your way. Part three is a use case for an application, right? And you don't even know this guy, and there's no way he would have paid for the software, you know, if he couldn't have just, you know, get on, right? You know, and then I think the third way, the third really is the, um, the more, you know, the more capitalistic, you know, approach that, you know, that, you know, that we, you know, that we're going to go open source because most of the funding models today, or a lot of the funding, not, you know, I mean, that's shifting a little bit, but a lot of the funding models, you know, see, or like, Oh, an open source project. Oh, it's got, um, you know, Joe Schmo. He's done, you know, like, I mean, Rod <laughs> Johnson. Celebrity open source. Yeah. yeah. What's this, you know, the guy who did spring source just created a new open source project. Oh, give him 10 million. Like why? It doesn't matter. Give him 10 million. It's Rod Johnson, you know, or yeah. right. And like, that's the more, you know, the VCs are just kind of, you know, just driving it in a very warped, I mean, there'll be an interesting, and I will write this someday, a chapter in my book about Docker and how the weird, um, you know, the convergence of a guy like Peter Fenton from Benchmark and Solomon getting Adam smashed together, right? Like, I won't say anymore, but like, you know, this Midas touch dude from Benchmark who was, you know, born with a silver spoon in his hand because his daddy was absolutely rich, but then turned around and did, you know, first round investment in MySQL, first round investment in, you know, uh, uh, Zen, Zen, you know, Zen yep. server. Um, he was, you know, so this guy was like picking winners in the early open source, like nobody's business. Um, but, you know, these guys are sharks. VCs are sharks, man. I mean, they, you know, somebody said one day that, you know, they, they won't even use oxygen unless they think there's actually a price point for the exhaust of the oxygen. <laughs> I mean, right. so so let's we, we need to we need to wrap up this podcast but uh i'm going to work with you to schedule a second a second time so we can talk about oh, this it. might be my worst podcast ever guys i don't think no, i've ever no, 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 just no. the opposite this i think is, imagine like people like going god who is that crazy? no this is this is where john lays down truth and I, i've never gone this in context. Context. That's what, this is this is what we like to do on latest shiny this is exactly the type conversation that the, not not just the what's but the why's it'll be interesting so, in the feedback you know if you get a lot of feedback then i think we get to hang out with five or six people and let's have this debate right like i would love somebody to tell me you know you're an idiot you're wrong or like let me give you the bright side here john because I, there are some good things going on like i would love to have that conversation we've, we've, we've done this open source stuff enough now that we actually should sit back and retrospect it um, and say, oh, this is not going to work. It's going to hurt people. It's yeah, going mean, to hurt. It's gonna hurt. To me, the yeah. defining moment in this podcast, the statement is, is like, we don't want to hurt, continue to hurt people. But yep. the negative is that we somehow kind of always do. And like, and then I feel like I'm part of that. I'm guilty for being part of that system. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, that, I mean, that's why I don't even really do product now. I do transformation. But the problem is, Everybody I go to, like, yeah, yeah, that's awesome, John. That's awesome. Like, that extreme mapping and, and, you know, Toyota Kata and, you know, all the things that made, like, Toyota incredibly successful for 60 years. Uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. But can you install Kubernetes with, for us? I love that. Demo. All right, all right. So, so I, we, have to, we have to wrap. The, all right, all right. Good, the, good. The, the point of lean DevOps Agile is respecting people. 
I'm pounding on the table. All right. That's I got, I got to do one last awesome thing. So I'm going to take up another two minutes. All right. So we did this thing at DevOps Enterprise Summit where we got uh, Dr. Steven Spears, who's like MIT Sloan, one of the leading lean guys on the planet. Uh, he wrote the original uh, Harvard Business Review, Decoding Toyota Production DNA. And then we got Dr. Decker, who's Resilience Engineering, um, Drift to Failure. Um, and then we had Dr. Cook, who is Why Complex Systems Fail, right? So we got the three of those guys in a four-hour panel. And there was a lot of discussion from the safety guys thinking lean was deterministic and it's a model that, that kind of gives false, falseness to all this, you know, which was not like Steven Spears' version and Mike Rotha, who I'm a big fan of. At one point, uh, Spears said, you know what? He said, first off, let's stop saying lean. It's Toyota. I'm like, okay. And he said, you, want, you know what, really? And people talk about the pull system, he said. He said, it, like, we all talk about the pull system and, you know, how, you know, how we, we create this collaboration to create a pull system. You know what, really? The two things generated the Toyota production system. He said, one was when they started, they were unbelievably crappy at doing what they do, and they knew they were crappy at it. So they had to figure out a way to compete with people who weren't crappy at it, right? So that created just in time, all that stuff. But this is the more poignant thing that I thought was so brilliant. He said, the other thing was that a Japanese worker at Toyota knew that the cost of a car for one of their neighbors, brothers, mothers, aunts was somewhere in a neighborhood, and I, and I don't remember the exact number, it's 60% of their total income. So that means that if their neighbor or their brother or sister were going to buy a Toyota car, they, and because they needed it, like to get to work or something like that, that they were literally forfeiting some, you know, plus 50% of their total yearly income wow. for that car, right? And again, don't quote me on this. This is Spears said, and I had, well, find it there. But here's the thing. He said that everybody in the chain, the supply chain, understood that. So everybody, no matter how far you went back or how horizontal you went from the assembly line, everybody felt this obligation to deliver something because they knew it could have been their neighbor, their brother, their sister, their mother that was going to give up plus 50% of their revenue. Like, like that's, because that's it was how waste. great systems work. It, was it wasn't use. It wasn't good. Right, they were giving it away because it was wasteful. Not because no, they, in fact, you know, one is, again, they knew they were crappy and they had to be really good, so how do you attack and attack waste? But number two was, why was the culture of quality, it wasn't like somebody went around and banged them over the head with it. It was just this sense that, you know, we see the movies about Toyota people having pride, but it was deep, the Spears say it was deeper than that. Like you felt a kinship to like – like if I did a crappy job and my neighbor spent 50 plus percent of his income on this thing, that's just, you know, that's just not right as a human being. Yeah. So, it, you know, right. to, to kind of what you're saying, and I promise I'll shut up, is like if, it's, if there is hope for IT, <laughs> then like we have to get to a place where we all see that what we do matters. And it matters to people who are on the edge, if you will, of what we do until we can consistently have a mantra of me, you, Joe, Bob, Tom, all the people that we interact with that do this stuff. When we wake up in the morning, we say, what are the consequences of what we're going to do today based on our quality, on something that could fail for somebody or somebody who could die based on what we do? And until we can generally get that mantra in our industry, um, you know, and uh, there's a whole nother discussion about something I'm working with Gene about ethos, uh, an industry ethos. There'll be, uh, you'll see more about that, but we don't have time to go into it. But yeah, I mean, that's that. that You have to get rid of the VCs because. <laughs> All right, wait, stop. Profit. <laughs> we will, we, we're, uh, I'm committed. John, I want to commit you to a part two. Let's All right. Wrap this. <laughs> it's been an hour. All right. All right. Same I'm going to wrap that. I'm just going to force the wrap up. <laughs> and uh, and thank both of you and uh, John. It was a great discussion. John, if someone wants to catch you, uh, obviously Bachigaloop on uh, Twitter. That, any any other website they should go to? Or no, that's the best place. You know, as long as you can spell it, B O T C H A G A L U P E. But yeah, and that's you know that's kind of my nexus for all activity, which is Twitter. So okay, well, and thanks stay, again. To, stay tuned for part two. Where and we stay talk tuned about for part SR. two and. Uh, Thanks again, John and Rob. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it was fun.